definitely end game. first learned about apologetics when I was a teenager in a summer youth missions program called Street Invaders. This is similar to the larger and more recognized youth with mission program. Before they sent us off on our mission, we were trained with a variety of apologetic arguments. Back then I understood apologetics to be a set of arguments based on reason or scripture that defends your Christian belief. For example, someone might ask, how do you know Jesus rose from the dead? And we'd respond, because the disciples were killed for declaring that Jesus was raised from the dead. If the disciples were lying, they could have simply told the truth in order to avoid being killed. There were also soldiers positioned outside of Jesus' tomb when he died. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the soldiers could have simply shown Jesus' body to the disciples as proof. I grew to be quite good at apologetics, to the point where other Christians would come to me with questions they were not able to answer themselves. One individual asked me for help. He told me that someone proved that God was not real by looking up to the sky and yelling, God, if you're up there, then strike me down. I responded, do you really think God would obey that person's command? God doesn't have to obey people. He doesn't want to harm them. He wants to save them. Once I was able to attend Bible college, my knowledge of apologetic responses grew. I'd spent four years of my life studying theology at Bible college and another three years studying religious philosophy. I'd often argue with atheists about the existence of God, and I never once ran into an argument for which I had no response. What I was not prepared for was to defend the existence of a different God. When I returned to university in my 30s, I was taking a class that required a completion of a large group project. I was partnered with a great group of people that would soon become my friends. They were great to work with, and unlike the other groups I had been in, they worked just as hard as I did to complete our group project. During my entire time at university, I stayed in touch with them, and we'd often get together to study and work on other projects. One day, I received a call from one of them, asking if I'd like to attend an event they were having at the university. Without hesitation, I agreed, although I didn't even know what the event was. When I arrived, I saw that it was an Islamic evangelical event. Their community leader, their imam, was putting on a presentation to proselytize to university students. It was very reminiscent of many of the Christian evangelical events I had attended and participated in. I thought I might as well stay to hear them out. I thought perhaps I could use this as an opportunity to witness my friends in exchange. If I heard them out, maybe they would hear me out as well. I wasn't oblivious to Islam. I had studied it a little in university, and of course we had heard all the warnings about it in church. Although I never attended one of their events before, I thought this would be a great opportunity to present the gospel. I sat down and listened to the entire presentation. The imam made a number of claims as he professed that Islam was the one true religion. At one point, the imam said, The Quran says, and indeed, we created humankind from an extract of clay, then placed each human as a sperm drop in a secure place. How could the Quran have been written around 600 to 650 CE and know about embryology unless it was divinely written? He went on to provide a number of other examples. People died for this belief. If it was a lie, they could have easily recanted and been saved. People have a natural instinct to believe in God. This is evidence that Allah is real. Islam is one of the largest religions in the world. How could so many believe it if they were incorrect? The Quran says, As for the earth, we spread it out, and how superbly did we smooth it out? How could they have possibly known back then that the universe was expanding? I wasn't persuaded in the least by these arguments. After all, just because the book had some references to true things didn't mean the entire thing was true. According to their logic, Hindu could also be their true religion, since they make many of the same claims. In fact, Srimad Bhagavatam, 3rd Canto, 31st chapter, gives a vivid description of the growth of the embryo in the mother's womb in greater detail than the Quran. Does that make the Srimad Bhagavatam more true than the Quran? While the arguments in this Islamic presentation were not persuasive, they were familiar. These apologetic arguments were the same ones I used myself in the past to defend my own faith. Christians died for this belief. If they were lying, why not simply recant? People over the centuries naturally believe that God exists. Israel becoming a nation in 1948 is a blatant Bible prediction, showing that the Bible is true. I realized I could substitute the religion in any of my apologetic arguments, and the validity of the argument would not change. 
If I argued that my scriptures made predictions that came true based on my interpretation or the interpretation of others, then other holy books could do the same, as I addressed in the interpretation error video. Interpreting holy books is faulty at the best of times. If I argued a claim based on what the Bible says, then a similar claim in any other holy book has equal weight. If I argued that Jesus was the only way to heaven because it was written in the Bible, the Quran has equal justification in saying that Jesus was simply a prophet. If I excuse problematic issues in the Bible, such as errors, contradictions, and immoral guidance, then any other religion has the right to excuse problematic issues in their holy books. If someone says the Bible can't be true because it condones slavery, I can't simply reply, that's because it was a different time and people wouldn't understand a commandment against slavery. If I were to use that response, then any criticism of any other holy book could do the same. The escape clause I used as a kid when confronted with a problematic scripture passage, it is simply beyond our current understanding, now becomes an equally valid response to criticisms of any other holy book. If I used apologetical arguments using reason, such as the unmoved mover argument of Thomas Aquinas, that also becomes a proof for any other religion. During the Islamic presentation, I realized every affordance I grant to my beliefs, to the Bible, and to my reasoning of Christianity, I now have to grant to the other religions as well. Pointing out flaws in other holy books is insufficient without acknowledging the flaws in my own holy book. I could no longer identify logical fallacies in other religions without first acknowledging mine. I knew every argument I had used for Christianity was equally as valid for proving Islam, Hindu, or almost any other religion. The event ended. I thanked my friends and I went home. From that day forward, I never engaged in apologetical arguments again. I've put a link in the description to a great video from Paula G on this subject. Be sure to check it out. In the next video, I discuss the final error, the hiddenness error. See you then.